Hallelujah. Oh, friends, today receive all that he has. All that he has. All he's designed to do. But there's no reason for anybody to walk out of here in bondage today. There's no reason for anybody to walk from this place today without being free. Because he that the sun sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, I thank you for the power of your spirit that gives life. And I pray today, Lord, that the breakthroughs that are happening right now in this room will not be just for a moment, but Lord, we will walk in that victory. We will walk in that provision. We will be people of breakthrough because we refuse to accept anything less than total breakthrough in every circumstance and situation. Lord, as we look to your word today, let it transform us, let it change us, continue working in us the will and to do of your good pleasure, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said amen. amen. Amen, you can be seated if you're able. This morning, we continue in the word today as we have been visiting with the seven churches of Revelation. Each of these churches, the Lord has something to say that have to do with a part of who he is. The revelation that he, John received in, in, in Revelation chapter one speaks to every issue, every problem that the church has. Aren't you grateful Jesus is enough for whatever you face? That Jesus is enough for every situation, every circumstance, and we see the vision of who he is coming to bear upon every church that we're looking at together today. Revelation chapter three, the day of the church at Sardis. The church at Sardis. Until the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works that you have a name that you are alive but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before Lord God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When you read about the church at Sardis, as a minister of the gospel, it brings me to, to these challenges of how I communicate to you on a Sunday morning just like this. Because the Lord is very emphatic in saying, I'm drawing a straight line here of something that needs to be dealt with. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. And then he says, strengthen those things that remain. And so it's a very strong word. It's a very pointed word. Yet as a minister of the gospel, I, I have the need to say that, that I'm grateful that the Lord is also a God who is gracious and loving and tender. And the Father who calls us to righteousness and purity and perfection is also the one who tenderly will come to us because he loves us, because his desire is for our good. His desire is for our, our, our ability to live life to its fullest in his divine plans and purposes. And so he comes with a heart of love and a heart of grace to us as he brings to bear upon a church like Sardis these emphatic words. I'm grateful for the passage in the Psalms where it says every other verse, for his mercy endures forever. For his mercy endures forever. You know, God doesn't have to say the same thing twice. So if he says it more than once, he's trying to get through something to us. In the face of everything he's saying, his mercy, his grace is being spread abroad even in the church of Sardis when they're receiving such a strong, strong word. And I can't imagine Jesus saying other than his desire to love us and to care for us. There's a statement here that's very controversial, but that's never stopped me from preaching about it. He says, he that overcomes 
shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Let me hasten to say, we believe in the grace of God. We believe that you can't lose your salvation in a moment's time or, or by, by a mistake that you make, because everybody has made a mistake. I'm not really comfortable preaching now because apparently three-fourths of this crowd is perfect. <laughs> so those who have made mistakes, you're with me. Let's just have this service together here. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Can we admit that? Come on. Can we acknowledge that? We've all, we've all messed up. We've all messed up. And yet the Lord, very emphatic here, if it wasn't possible for your name to be blotted out, he wouldn't have said that. Here's the tragedy of, that, of a doctrine that says, you know what, if 40 years ago you walked down the aisle, joined a church, and, and prayed a sinner's prayer, that you're safe. Even though your entire life has been lived outside of God, outside of his plan, his purpose, and everything about that. And I'm afraid there are many, many people who are deceived this morning that one day, 30 years ago, they walked down front and made a confession of faith, but their life has never reflected that confession. I know the, I, I just knew the amens were going to drown me out in this one. So, the truth will set you free. My concern is not for those of us who are walking with God and mess up, because we, we've all done that. And God's grace is sufficient. Amen? Amen? God's grace covers us. But there is something here where the Lord says, you, You've professed my name, and you've, never, you've not walked with me. If, you're over, if you'll be an overcomer, your name will not be blotted out of the book of life because that book is the most important book in the world. Yes. I said that book is the most important book in the world because when, when you open your heart to Jesus as people did even this, in the service this morning already, your name is written in that book. You see, the only thing I got going for me is my name's in the book. Everything else is up for discussion, but my name's in that book. And when we talked about uh, last year, when, whenever I stand before the, for the Lord and he looks at the record of my life, Ronald Frank McManus, born in New Orleans, Louisiana, age unknown. <laughs> when, when he starts down the list of all the mistakes Ron's made, the son will tap him on the shoulder and say, Father, let's see if his name is in another book. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And the father will open the book. Ronald Frank McManus saved on a Sunday night in 19 blah, blah, blah. And the Father will say, because your name is in that book. This book doesn't matter. This book doesn't matter. So it's a big deal. This is a big deal. The Lord says to those that overcome, their name will never be blotted out of that book. And so everything that the Lord is talking about to the church at Sardis is so important here because there, there are two things that, that are the theme of this record of the church in Sardis. First of all, it's about life, which is opposed to death. Secondly, it's about a name. Four times here the, name, the word name occurs. Look at verse one, thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. There are few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. He that overcometh thou shalt not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father. Four times, and he keeps talking about the matter of life and death. He keeps talking about that. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. Everything focuses on the name and on life. And so the church at Sardis is about 60 years old. And Jesus steps into that scene and he says, about two generations now have gone. Here's the tragedy. Here's what history tells us about church denominations and groups. Second generation, 
Things kind of deteriorate a little more, third generation, even more. It takes you usually three or four generations for them to forget where they came from. And the result is they keep functioning. All the things keep going on in the church, but they don't even realize they've lost the most important thing. And that's the life of Jesus in that church. And I want to say today, if there's anything that I want for me and for Calvary Church, I want the church that I'm part of to be what you want, Jesus. To be the church you want it to be. Jesus is the focus of the life of the church. He's saying these things to them. Those things that remain in you, strengthen those things. And I want you to notice these things to begin with in verse one. These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits of God. Talking about the full complement of the operation of the Holy Spirit in the church. That will manifest through Jesus. Everything of the Holy Spirit is going to come through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is only interested in glorifying Jesus. How do you know when you see manifestations? How do you know when you see all kinds of things happening in, uh, in church services and church meetings? How do you know if this is the real deal? I'll tell you if you know it's the real deal because when everything is said and done, man is not exalted, man is not glorified. If it's the Holy Spirit, Jesus is always glorified. Jesus is always exalted. Anything that brings glory to man is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit exalts Jesus. The full complement of God's Spirit flows through those of us who know Jesus, who walk with him. And that's where the life of the church is. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no life in the church. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no life in the church. And there's only way that life is going to happen is by the Holy Spirit, Jesus who has the seven spirits, the full complement of the working of the Holy Spirit in the church. And then he says, the seven stars, referring to the angels or the pastors of those seven churches. He says, not only does life flow through me, but life flows through those that I've appointed to minister, to preachers and teachers and the pastors of these churches. These are all in my hand. And you think through that whole process and you study it in the scripture, two things come to focus. First of all, it gives us an appropriate regard for the leadership that God gives, but appropriate regard never gets out of balance. And so it's so important as we talk about a, a new pastor uh, maybe coming to us shortly. There's two things that we don't wanna do. Number one is, is put him on a pedestal because all of us, are still in the flesh. Your new pastor will make mistakes. That's why he's welcome here. Uh, I don't know of a pastor that, that could function in a perfect church. Because there are none. See, because we, because we all have warts, we're all still in process and we can accept others who have warts too. So on one hand, we don't put leadership on a pedestal. We, we acknowledge them and we submit our lives to their spiritual leadership because that's what the Holy Spirit calls us to do. But secondly, we don't chew on them about everything we don't like. Mm -mm, I felt anointed when I said that. Oh. <laughs> we don't chew on them with every little thing we don't like because that's gonna be the case in whoever it is. You know, some people would not be satisfied with Jesus pastoring our church. So God helps somebody who's flawed trying to do it. We don't put them on a pedestal nor do we disregard them and fail to realize that they have been called by God and we're to submit our lives to spiritual leadership in our lives. You know, it's amazing how, how that spirit of rebellion is so contagious in our society right now. And unfortunately, even Christians. You know, I mean, out here on Interstate 40, I mean, I mean, people get shot. 
because they cut in front of somebody. I mean, that's, there's just so much anger running under the surface. Have you noticed that? There's so much anger running under the surface. I think coming out of COVID just made it worse. And, and there's just so much of that. And you know, uh, we find that in church as well sometimes, you know. Uh, I remember back in the day when, when uh, our church was growing very, very rapidly, we had three morning services in a room that would seat about 400 people and, and it was jammed. And so what we were having to do to get everybody in, we were having people to come in and file in row after row after row after row. You know what I'm about to tell you. There were some people said, you ain't gonna tell me where to sit. <laughs> really? Well, where's that spirit from? We're just asking you to help us. Huh. See, I knew it was gonna get quiet. <laughs> Nobody's gonna tell me what to do. Where's that spirit from, sir? You didn't get that from the Holy Spirit. You know, in fact, uh, a pastor, uh, got a, a, an email from a dear lady who had, she, she had visited uh, this church, a very, very large church. She visited three times. And she wrote the email to the pastor and here's what she said. I've attended your church three times. Every time I've come, I was told I was sitting in the wrong seat. I won't be back. You know, that's not the problem here at Calvary, but we do have churches where Sister Sadie has her cushion in that spot. God help anybody who sits in her spot, you know. And it's, it's so important that we learn how to be flexible. Huh? That we learn how to live with other people and, and give and take and, you know, because that, this, that spirit of, it's about me and about mine, you know. Uh, between services, uh, I, I went and ran upstairs for a second and my son sent me an email. It better have been before church this morning there from my grandson who's two. And uh, the video I got, he was being introduced to, uh, in Florida, Jupiter Donuts. Got that chocolate frosting on that thing. So my two-year-old grandson, they're, they're shooting video of him and they head in front of him. And the first words out of his mouth are, mine. He's two years old. You see, I keep telling parents, you can coach that baby all you want to, to say, dada, mama. But I'm gonna tell you the first words out of that baby's mouth is gonna be mine, because that sin nature is still there. That's gonna get redeemed, but it's, it's still there. And that's, that's, that is that spirit, a spirit about, of, of rebellion that says, nobody's gonna tell me what to do, it's all about me, and, and I'm not gonna, and, and then we do that with God sometimes. And so it's so important that we, we understand life doesn't come from us. It comes from him. He is the giver of life. And so what he is saying to the church at Sardis, you have a name that you live, but you're dead because you forgot where life comes from. And here's the challenge for everybody in the room today. I know you don't need this, but you know people who do, so pay attention right now is that life doesn't come from Ron. Life doesn't come from how cool Ron is. Life doesn't come from how good my cologne is. Life doesn't come from what I have achieved. Life comes from him. His name is Jesus. And the tragedy, the tragedy of this church was they acted like they had life, but they were dead. You know why? Because they became all about them and not about Jesus. Jesus is the life of the church. I said Jesus is the life of Calvary Church. Jesus is the one who gives us life. It's about him, about him. And so we want to glorify Jesus. We want to exalt Jesus. We don't want to have a name that we live and we're not, and we're not alive. We want to be alive. And the way you stay alive is acknowledge everything I am and everything I have and everything I ever hope to be. It's because of Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is life. And church, the moment we begin to make it about us, we start dying. We start dying personally, and we start dying as a church. 
He is the life of the church. And then he speaks about the issue about a name. You have a name. A name has to do with an identity. An identity. When you speak of a name, you're talking about a character. My name is Ron. That's my identity. But that's not what I stand for. Because what I stand for is how I act. What I stand for is my character. What I, have to, what I stand for is the uh, quality of my life. And that's to do with authority as well. That's why in any role that we have, our job is to submit to whatever authorities God puts in our lives. I remember many, many years ago being in a situation in a church where I was serving on a, on a staff on the West Coast. And there were some people that were trying to create division and, and problems in that church. And as a staff member, I was asked to join in. I'm grateful that I did not respond to become a part of a rebellion or a problem to somebody else in ministry. The only reason God has given me any authority today is because I refuse to usurp authority in my life. Friends, when you, you know, all of us have, have authority in our lives that we don't like everything they do, we don't like everything they say, you know, and the case is true for me. But my job at that point was to submit to the authority God had put in my life. And I'm gonna tell you, when you do that, God will always protect you. I said, God will always protect you because you do that. Submission to authority, living in authority. I have a responsibility to live in submission to authority in my life. Our pastoral candidate is a person who I know already does that. Our staff, are, it's important they do that. We all have authorities that God puts in our lives to guard us and protect us. And God will always, always take care of us we live within the, the confines of whatever authority God's put in our life. So our name is about our identity. It's about our integrity. And it's about our authority. And it's about a quality of life. All of that's in a name. It's the reputation. Your reputation. And the word that Jesus used here, verse one and two qualifies that dead because he says, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. They're not dead yet, but they're about to die. Strengthen those things that remain so that you can move forward. So the Lord is saying, whatever name has come to you, the name of Jesus must be applied to us. We've got to identify with him. He calls us to identify with him. Be watchful and strengthen. That watchfulness is important. Be careful that you don't let circumstances and situations and attitudes from other people influence who you are, influence who you become. Be watchful. Wake up, he said to the Ephesian church. Be watchful and strengthen those things that remain. It's not all done, church. There's still so much more that I have for you, he is saying. Don't let things start to sag. Everybody in Sardis, hey, listen. Strengthen those things that remain. And the Lord is trying to say, Sardis, you're at a place where you could, you could die as a church. You need to take a hold of those things that need to be strengthened in your church. Hold to those things that strengthen in your life because I'm not done with you. I've got plans for you. You see, to me, the, the most wonderful, gracious thing about these seven churches is that the Lord continues to speak to them. The Lord continues to shape them up. He continues to talk to them. Listen, if God leaves you alone, you better be careful. As long as God's still messing with you, there's hope for you. I'm glad God's still messing with me. I mean, he's messing with me every week. He's smacking me around every week. Ron, why you do that? Why did you do that? Why did you say that? You know, I, I told you about an uh, incident and I had another one just the, in the last week. I got a report of something in the business we're part of. Uh, it just ticked me off. Other than that, I was in good shape. But it just, it just really irritated the fool out of me. 
And I looked up a phone number of who was in charge of who's in charge of who's in charge at the state of North Carolina. I had some things to say. How many have been there? And as I'm ready to, I've looked up the number now of the supervisor who's over the people that, that have ticked me off and I'm about to make that call. I mean, I'm, I'm punching the numbers in and the Holy Spirit said, uh-huh, go right ahead. You want to screw this up even more? Go ahead and make that call, son. Because I'm not sure I can get you out of this mess if you let your flesh control it. It hurt for a moment. But I stand here before you 36 hours later, grateful that God loved me enough to stop me in my tracks. I said that God loved me enough to keep me from messing up stuff, even worse. <laughs> Hallelujah, yeah. Even worse. Life is the opposite of death, and I was about to pour a lot of death into somebody's life. It's sure in life. And here's what the Lord says, church, I've got plans for you. I said this months ago, I want to reiterate it today on the verge of a pastoral candidate coming in two weeks. God has plans for each of us and God has plans for this church that are far beyond anything you understand at this moment. And I come in these moments as we go through these churches, first of all, to say, God, what do you need to say to Ron? I'm not going to, I'm not going to apply something to you that, God, that I won't let God apply to me. But secondly, where do we need to shape up? Where do we need to get ready so that we don't hinder what God wants to do? That we, we don't hold back what God's planning to do, that God desires to do in us and through us. And so church, it's a sobering time in that we're saying, Lord, my life is not in me. It's not in my thoughts. It's not in my ideas, Lord. My life is in you. You are life, Jesus, and you are my life. And I want to live in that life. And secondly, I want my name to be more than he says he's this, but he's something else. That's what the Lord was saying to this church. Let me tell you the tragedy of where we're at. Unless something changes, and I'm spending hundreds of hours working with churches that, that are right at the verge of death, and working with the lay people in those churches who desperately want life to come back to their church. But here, in just the fellowship we're part of, called the Assemblies of God, unless they start strengthening the things that remain, the stats tell me within, next, within the next 10 years or less, 3,000 churches will die in the Assemblies of God. You see, it's an oxymoron for a Pentecostal spirit-filled church to die. How's that possible? The Lord just said to Sardis, his art, how it happens. You have a name that you live, but you're dying. You're dying because you've chosen your own way. You're dying because you chose your own route instead of seeking me and draw life from me. Draw wisdom from me. Draw knowledge from me. Church, can we just admit together today that this church belongs to Jesus? Yeah. This church belongs to Jesus. And so the question is, Lord, how do we fit into your plan? Because God is really not interested in fitting into yours. He has no interest in fitting into your idea and your plan and your desire. What he's saying to all of us, including Ron, Lord, What's your desire? What's your plans? Let me fit into that. Because I want to have life. <laughs> I want to have life in Jesus' name. He calls us to believe for the fulfillment of his divine plan for us. And here's what he says. If you'll believe it, I'll fulfill it. 
That's why faith is so important for all of us today. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you can see it, you don't need faith. And so the, the Lord says, if you, if you will believe it, if you believe I've got a plan for your life, if you believe that I want to do great things through you, if you believe that I've called you to the kingdom for such a time as this, if you believe you've been put here in this moment with divine destiny and plan for your life, if you believe it, I'll fulfill it. I'll fulfill it. I'll fulfill it. Hallelujah. Mm, Lord. I know people sitting in this room right now, God gave you promises many, many years ago that have never been fulfilled because you kind of dialed out on it or you chose the, your own way. All of us have been guilty of that. You can't listen to the radio if you turn the volume off. And that's why the Lord said, remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast to what I gave you. Hold fast to what I told you. If not, I'm gonna come as a thief in the night. Remember when Samson faced the enemies of God and he was so powerful and triumphant. And yet, when the enemies came against him, he had so messed up and tried to do things on his own. Here's what the Bible says about him. And he wished not that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. Jesus said, remember and watch, keep giving attention to those things that are crucial in your life and I'll take care of everything else. I don't know about you, but I want a name that matters. This is kind of a little scary, I'm gonna say it anyway. I want the devil to know my name. I'm not afraid of him. I want, I want the, my, my name to be a problem to the devil. I want my name to be on his hit list because I know greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. Here's the last thing he talks about. He talks about garments. They that walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The pure garments, the spotless garments, and somehow we've had this belief system of, of, of days gone by that, you know, when this, this whiteness and this purity and, and all these things that, you know, white garments means that you don't want to get tainted by the world out there, you know, because you got a white garment on. You know, you don't want to get messy with all the stuff that's out there in Greensboro. That's just horrible. I was, because you got a white garment on. Let me just tell you what that white garment means. It doesn't mean you shy away from the world. It doesn't mean that you hide out somewhere so that nobody messes with you. It means because you have that white garment, you can do what Jesus did. You can walk in with, to leprous people and they're healed. You can walk in and touch the blind and eyes open. You can walk into the gutters of Greensboro and bring the life of Jesus there. You know, stop worrying about getting tainted, brothers and sisters. It's time to get dirty for Jesus. It's time, it's time for us to, to get out where the needs are, where the hurting are, where the broken are. Because God's plan for this great church is that they come from every part of Greensboro. They come from every dimension of Greensboro. And they may not even look like us or act like us, but they're men and women who desperately need Jesus and we're gonna be a lighthouse to this city. We're gonna be a lighthouse to this city. And, and, and our garments don't get tainted by doing what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He hung out with publicans and sinners. In fact, the religious people kind of, kind of did him in. Well, you, you, know, you hang out with all those sinners. And Jesus said, absolutely, Jeff. I am so guilty. I want us to be guilty of that too. White garments of white, which means we are covered by the blood of Jesus. We know who we are. And life begins to flow from us to the leprous, to the withered hands, to those that are hurting, those that are broken. It's the wholeness of the Lord happening 
through us. And verse four says, they shall walk with me in white, the key to purity. You wanna know the commands of the Lord and how to live it? Just walk with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Worthy of those that walk with Jesus. You don't have to walk around and say, I'm worthy. You've been worthy because of the blood of Jesus. And we walk into the hell holes of Greensboro with the blood of Jesus, with the kingdom of God, knowing who we are and what we've been called to do. The word Sardis, word for Calvary Church. This church is about life. It's about the life of Jesus in us. We're not exalting a man. We're not exalting a program. We're not exalting a person. We're exalting the only one that matters here, and his name is Jesus. We want to get more like him. I said we want to be more like him. Exalting him. Glorifying him. And the result will be that we have a name. Not a name that says we live and we're dead, but a name that says his life is in us. And so we can become people of integrity, people of authority, people of quality. Because it's not about us, it's about him in us. And so the challenge today and the opportunity today is to say, Jesus, let your life flow through Calvary Church like never before. And that life flows to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. You're welcome here. Take control of everything here. Do we have any takers today? I, I just, Holy Spirit, just do that in Ron today. Life in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray today that you would just take that word and let it find its place in our hearts today that you would cleanse us and renew us afresh. We want your life flowing through us, Lord. We want your life through the power of the Holy Spirit being magnified in our lives. And though we want a name that doesn't represent death, we want a name that represents life. And so Holy Spirit, do that work in us. With our heads bowed in this room for just a moment as I conclude this service today, I wonder how many in the room would just say, Ron, I'm here today, and I need that life today in me. Maybe there's a time when you walked with the Lord, but today you're, you're walking far off, and you need Jesus to touch your life and change it today. He waits with outstretched arms to do that today, but he can't help you till you will just acknowledge your needing. But if you'll acknowledge your needing today, he's gonna run to you with his love today in this place. His presence fills this house right now. And I wanna pray for people all over the room who just say, that's me. I need to experience his life afresh in me today. He that the Son has life, and he that hath not the Son does not have life. I wanna pray with people today to say, Jesus, come with your life and transform my life. If that's you today, you need Jesus to touch your life and change it. Just lift your hand where you are. I'm gonna pray for you right there. Yes, others right now, just raise it up wherever you're at. Ron, I need that to happen in me today. Yes, sir, right over here, sir, I see it. Others right now, that's me. Just raise it up high where, wherever you're at. I need that to happen in me, Ron. Would you believe with me today for that to happen? Yes, ma'am, right over here, I see that hand. Others right now, in this moment, I just need to experience his life fresh in my life today, Ron. I've seen several hands where there are others who want to be included. I want to talk to those beyond the walls of the room in this moment whether you're on a, in a kitchen or a couch, wherever you might be right now in this moment, you can reach by faith and say, I want that life too, Ron. We're gonna pray together in the next few moments and believe for, that, for the Spirit of God to minister that life to each of us. I'm waiting just a moment. Anybody else in the room? Just, Ron, that's me. Include me in that prayer. I just need to experience his life fresh today in my life. I need to experience his life today in me. Yes, yes, yes. We're gonna pray together. We're gonna to pray together, we're gonna to believe together for the Lord to do that today, right here in this room and beyond the walls of this room in this moment. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that he came forth from the day grave, we can be saved and changed. 
Maybe you walked with the Lord, but today you need to renew yourself and your commitment to Him today. Just pray that prayer with me right now. Let's, and others in the congregation, would you just join with those who lifted a hand that are gonna pray that prayer right now. Would you just join with them in, a, in the power of agreement and pray it with them right now as I lead you? Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I open my heart to you. Pray it aloud. I open my heart to you. I believe you came to this earth. You gave your life on a cross that I could have life. Jesus, I invite you now to fill me with your life. Change my life today. Empower my life today through your Holy Spirit. I open my heart to you now. From this moment forward, I choose to walk in the power of your life. I pray you would touch me today. Change me today by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand all over the room, church. Come on, everybody standing. Let's give the Lord praise. Come on, let's give the Lord praise in the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm gonna ask our prayer partners, ask our prayer partners to come and stand across the front here right now. You prayer partners, just come and, and stand right here across the front with me right now. We're just gonna believe the Lord together. As we begin to sing in the next few moments, I'm gonna ask those of you who lifted your hand and maybe others in this room today who would say, I just need that prayer of agreement. I need somebody to pray for that situation, that circumstance in my life. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed to acknowledge that you need God's touch today in your life. We're gonna to sing together and I'm gonna ask many of you, those who prayed with me and others who just need to step out from where you're at for, that, for this moment and believe God to do something supernatural in your life. Don't leave today without your miracle. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the Spirit of God that's available right now in this house. We're gonna sing. You need to step out by faith to come receive your miracle today. You come right now. Come on, let's sing it together.